bumpy and very fast also, you know, and should be careful. And just I hope this morning uh, no more ice up. It's been fairly dry, there seems to be fairly dry air. I think the stages will probably be dry, you know, I don't think there'll be a lot of ice or snow. Over. But There's a lot of opposition here this weekend, but we have had a very good practice done. The car's gone excellent, it has been paired, prepared perfectly. So we're very happy the way things are looking, we definitely try and go for a win anyway. Other conditions I think are going to be the big factor today. The uh, frost has been very bad last night together. So, uh, well, have you taken any precautions for the, to cover that? Well, the first stage doesn't start for about an hour and a half, so we'll, we'll have to see what the conditions are then. Galway City in the first round of the 1986 STP Tarmac Championship. As competitors report for scrutiny on the eve of the rally, Inter centers on the new generation of rally cars like the four-wheel drive Metro. It is a time for checking that everything complies with the Road Traffic Act and indeed the safety regulations. It is a time for intense speculation, as in addition to Ireland's top three drivers, Billy Coleman, Bertie Fisher and Austin McHale, the programme also includes the Middle East champion, Saeed El Hajri. For Barbara Buckley, clerk of the course, it is a nervous moment. The pressure on the organising team is um, very, very heavy, regardless of where the entry, uh, entries come from. Uh, however, when you have such a big presence of overseas competitors, we feel we're under closer scrutiny. Air Square at 9 o'clock on Saturday morning, and last year's winners Austin McHale and Christy Farrell are the first off the ramp in the Clarenbridge Crystal sponsored event. Billy Coleman, who has won the rally twice before, is at number two in the Rothmans Porsche 911 with co-driver Ronan Morgan. This time, Bertie Fisher and Austin Fraser have an extra passenger in the Manta 400, the in-car camera, which will be bringing us spectacular action from the driver's viewpoint. 20 miles down the road, however, the real action begins. And those worrying thoughts about ice do not prove to be ill-founded. Austin McHale has the dubious honor of finding out exactly where the ice patches are. Coleman employs a deceptively gentle approach that will prove to be very effective, while Bertie Fisher really attacks. But the Manta is having chronic traction problems. These two experts have come to see the Metro. But all is not well with Bolton's car and it seems to be definitely down on par. John Coyne. John has done few events in recent times, and he seems to be a little bit rusty. At this point, Richie Healy and his new escort probably regrets selling his old one, as the young Tipperary flyer, Frank Maher, is catching him on the first stage. Billy Connolly has changed from an escort to a Vauxhall. By stage two, Loch Coutre, Austin McHale is already in trouble. He has been second fastest to Billy on the first section, but a heavy landing on this stage will cause him serious oil leaks. Experience shows with Coleman and Morgan. Cyril Bolton and Derek Irvine are going better now, and the 22-year-old Frank Maher is establishing himself as one of the flyers of this event as Mike Dunyon and David Stone wend their high-speed way through the Arctic conditions, we have already lost Pat White, Richie Healy, Kieran McAnallen and William Murphy. 
And indeed, it looks as if Austin McHale's future is decidedly dodgy as the Shell Oil's dealer Opel Team Ireland car arrives in the Gord service area at high speed. Austin, a big problem here. Yeah, on the last stage, the throttle cable is sticking open. We're full throttle. We can't. We have to turn off the ignition with the key and very frightening with the ice. It's happened about 10 times. Yep. So as well as that, we discovered about two miles from the end of the stage that we had no oil pressure. The eye light kept flickering on, on and off on corners. When we got to the end of the stage, uh, I don't think we dropped that much time. I think we dropped maybe about 30, 40 seconds. And uh, hopefully the engine's not damaged. Bolton's Metro also receives attention. He explains the problem. The biggest problem at the moment is noise. Like, when we've, uh, we can't hear the intercoms and can't hear what the engine's doing as well. I think it may have had a misfire uh, on the first stage. There's so much noise inside that you can't really tell exactly what's happening anyway. It's all been new to me as well. So uh, we'll see how we're going from now on. We've been pretty steady on the first two. Saeed, uh, one of the early sensations of this rally is the fact that uh, you're adapting to very strange terrain very quickly indeed. You know, I, 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 really, I try to go more, more faster, you know, but the problem, I'm very worried for maybe some ice in the, in the road, you know. And uh, I know, I, first my, you know, to heart, with heart break, it's first, first, first time for me in this road, you know, and I'm a little, little worried, but I try my best. Beginning to enjoy Galway. Yes, I'm really very happy, but I want to keep my car on the road, you know, rally. Well, keeping the car on the road is what it's all about in these conditions, and Coleman's featherlight feel has given him a one-minute lead. But to see how bad things really are, let's go inside Bertie Fisher's Manta. Walk up to your right, on the right. Having got away with that one, we are now approaching Shanelish Cross, where we saw Billy Coleman in action. It's a long way from the sands of guitar to the ice of the Tupper stage. But Saeed is coping admirably. John Coyne's first outing in the Manta 400 is proving somewhat fraught. Back inside the other Manta, Austin Fraser is relying now heavily on ice notes. 200 right on crest, 100 left on dip, 70 left mammy, and caution crest at the very fast right, keep tight, ice and exit. 70 left mammy. 70 right, 70 dip, 70 crest and slight left, 70 caution left over jump, 70 slight right on crest and caution, 50 turns fast square right, 70 right over crest. Tom McGee, like many of the superstars up front, is also having his problems at Shanelish. But now it's on into the mountains and the snow and the notorious corkscrew stage. Austin McHale in the Black Manta, despite using enormous quantities of his sponsor's products to keep running, is now in second place. After their early traction problems, Fisher and Fraser in fourth place get down to work on the corkscrew. Left. Fifty crest at the fast right. Fifty slight right. Fifty long, very fast right, loose. Fifty very fast left. Careful. And very fast right. Very fast left. Right. The leader under these circumstances decides that discretion is the better part of valour. Yet Billy Coleman continues to set the pace. The Fermana crew see this as a real chance for making up ground. Fifty very fast left. Careful. I'm very fast right. Very fast left. Right. The 
they slide right, left, and slide right. Seven, they harp and left, loose. definitely been the priority. The damage is mainly cosmetic, but El Hajri has dropped to third behind Coleman and McHale. We are now three quarters way through the corkscrew, and Fisher's luck is about to take a cruel turn. Very fast left. Try switching over the ignition pack. Is that it? Just plenty of fuel. It's almost like a fuel shortage, is it? As we leave the stranded pair, Hugh O'Brien has just overtaken Mike Patterson, who suspects a broken steering arm in his ear's escort. Back on the dry roads at the end of the corkscrew, McHale, despite his engine worries, is giving it everything and scattering the arrows in the process. It's now a two-way fight with Coleman. much in command. Saeed may not understand the sign, but the state of the Porsche certainly punches home the message. Despite the obvious indiscretions, the Arabian Charger is one of the talking points of the rally. His nerve and speed are astonishing. Jody McGrath is also in the entertainment business with his two-liter escort. Mike Patterson and David McElroy are in very close company. As are the retiring Frank Hogan and Martin Ward's Opal. Meanwhile, Bertie Fisher, although now many frustrating minutes adrift, has got the manta going again, and he manages just to stay in the rally. Austin Fraser resumes the pace notes to read the very slippery road to his driver. 50, 50, right. But their disappointment is obvious. Yeah, we're, uh, we're lost about 20 minutes on the corkscrew uh, with an electrical problem. We're not really sure it's something to do with one of the ignition packs, but we haven't really traced the problem. So a chance of victory is really gone, is it? No, it's impossible. Like we're 17 minutes behind Billy Coleman. Um, something similar behind Austin McHale, so... We're going to keep going anyway. Frank Maher, at this early stage of the rally, I don't think you honestly expected to be in fourth place, did you? No, not against this competition, but we're, we're driving on the limit and hoping for the best. There's no complaints at all, Alan. Um, the car has, has been flying, and um, I think we took the lead right in the first stage, which is unusual for me. I was told to make no mistake this time, so uh, <laughs> the pressure was on. It's your old teammate and uh, some would say adversary up and now into second place, Austin McHale, but uh, we know that he's having some problems, so uh, very early days yet, Billy, but you, you're looking pretty strong at the moment. Yeah, well, uh, just keep it there. I'll just keep our fingers crossed and nothing goes wrong, I suppose. We should be, should be okay. I mean, these roads are so, so tricky that, uh, you know, the um, smallest mistake and you can be in a wall, so you can never get too confident. By the second run over Loch Coutre on Saturday afternoon, Austin McHale still hangs on to second place, just under two minutes behind the leader. Frank Maher and co-driver Brian Clark are sensational as they wring the power out of the family-run escort and bring it up to third overall. But Al Hajri is only 12 seconds behind, and he's recovering from a puncture on the previous stage. The Talbot Sunbeam of Jim McDonald and Ronan McNamee is making its way up the leaderboard. They lie ninth as the cars head into service in Gort, where Billy Coleman has a handling problem with the Porsche. Could it be tyre pressures? 
they'll go up a bit. They go up four, four pounds. Because they're, they're like reading top D6 and top D7 now. Yeah, they're too high. Yeah, that's Pretty maybe what it is, you see. Billy, in your comfortable position at the moment? Yeah, we have a few problems just now, guys. What, what's happened? The car is, is running very rough. We don't really know what the problem is. But she's, is she's, it uh, slowing you up? Yeah, we've lost a bit of time in the last couple there now. You're still in the lead? Yes. Uh -huh. Yeah. Okay. Give me uh, 35 litres now. You want 35 litres? Yeah. yeah. More worrying problems for McHale as a compressor is brought in to boost that falling oil pressure. The service crew works frantically to solve the problem. Well, we have a new union back on now and hopefully that the engine will stay together because we're after running out of oil about three times or four times and uh, I hope we haven't any bearing damage done, so we'll keep our fingers crossed. Special stage nine, round Corkscrew Hill for the second time and McHale's oil pressure seems to be holding up for the moment. Coleman and Morgan still have a comfortable lead. They're content to turn down the pace just a little. Macher and Clark are thrilling the crowds with some very competitive driving. Ian Donaldson's 6R4 Metro is running sweetly and is holding on to fifth place. Hugh O'Brien and Paul Moore are sixth, but they're over two minutes behind the Metro. Dusk is falling as the cars start the 10th and final stage of the day. Oil pressure in McHale's Manta has dropped to just 20 pounds and he's losing a lot of time. Coleman is taking full advantage. Macher is still driving at 10 tenths but this time it's a little too much. Even so, he stays third. The spectators who brave the cold evening air are rewarded with some spectacular action as Judy McGrath from Dungannon finds his escort as a mind of its own. And the Opals of David McElroy and Frank Fennell seem to be running in tandem. The first day ends back in Gort, where the Maher family and friends are out in force to help keep the third-placed escort in top condition. Well, I have Frank that's walking with me as diesel, diesel mechanic. I have Tom as well that drives the van and he's another diesel mechanic. I have Pat who's a school teacher and girlfriend and a few nurses as well. Yeah. Ian Donaldson, the last surviving Metro driver. How's it going? It's going very, very well. We've had a couple of little problems today. We had a tyre choice that was wrong for one stage and uh, we've got a broken exhaust bracket, but apart from that, still learning to drive the car. So Billy Coleman, two minutes ahead at the end of the day. You should be very happy, but I think there is a slight problem with the, the car. Yeah, there is a mysterious problem. We, we, we can't find out what it is, but the, uh, there's, a, there's a, a vibration in the car at high speed. Mysterious. At first I thought I had a puncture or there was a wheel loose or something, but it's, it checked everything and can't find. So we just keep our fingers crossed that there's not a major um, problem in the transmission. Um, it hasn't slowed you down at all over the well, last Well, initially it did, but once I was satisfied there was nothing about to fall off, I, uh, I got going again. Boston McHale lang second to start of day two. The gap, I think, is about two minutes 40. Can you do it? Can you make it up? Yeah, something like that. Uh, go ahead, we'll get you again. <laughs> Rallying is all about time, and when you're lang second, you just can't afford to risk any penalties by staying too long in the service area. Stage 11, Kineska. It's 10 down, 8 to go for leader Coleman in the Rothmans Porsche. Mikhail starts the first stage of the day, hoping his mechanical problems are a thing of the past. The cars have started the stage in order. Frank Maher is third along the road and third on the leaderboard. 
Saeed Al Hajri is enjoying his first trip to Ireland, and the dry roads suit his very fast Porsche. Englishman Ian Donaldson may not have the power of a full works metro, but his 6R4 is still well placed. The Tyrone team of Hugh O'Brien and Paul Moore damaged their steering towards the end of the first day. On stage 11, they're caught and passed by Bertie Fisher. The action is relentless. driver and co-driver lives with the constant dangers of rallying. But for Bertie Fisher, the next few high-speed moments were to present a terrifying challenge which would need every ounce of his skill. He's traveling at 120 miles an hour and he responds magnificently. Tapers well done. It was one of those incidents that you often dream about and think never would happen. Uh, we had total brake failure uh, at a junction. Um, it, we have since discovered that it was due to a, a broken brake caliper. We were coming down about a 400 yard, 500 yard straight, something like that. Probably well in excess of 100 mile an hour. And uh, when I normally at that sort of speed, I would leave myself something like 75 to 100 yards for braking the car. And it was very clean dry tarmac so I was braking you know very very heavy and very very late when I braked very heavy there was just a snap inside the car just a like a click something broke and uh, the pedal went straight to the floor all I could see was a car and a lot of people in front of me and I saw two small children and I was I had my hand on the handbrake of the car with the thought going through my mind will I spin the car uh, I feel if I had spun the car at that point, I was out of control then uh, and would probably have hit some of the people. Uh, with so much momentum still in the car, you know, it certainly wouldn't have came to a stop by spinning it. At the last minute I saw what I thought was enough room and I just hoped that the children wouldn't move. They just seemed to freeze in their position and I saw what I thought was enough room between the front of a car, a marshal's car, which was blocking the road, and a wall. And I had a go and got it through. Well, it could have been a potentially very serious accident. In fact, it didn't happen. But it's the sort of thing that uh, we're both very, very concerned about, that had that possibly happened at another junction, where, which is lots of spectators, well then, you know, the thoughts just don't bear thinking about. Quite honestly, I think that 90% of spectators think that these cars are on railway lines. And they're not, you know, we're only human people that are driving them. The cars are all mechanical. Things can break and do break. Uh, you know, I think that um, we've probably been very lucky that there hasn't been, you know, much more serious accidents where a number of people have been seriously injured, you know. A chilling moment that will hopefully serve as a warning to spectators. Lives could depend on it. Meanwhile, Billy Coleman is six minutes ahead of the field and cruising home. been patched up by the Rothmans team mechanics and he's going to complete a Porsche 1-2. But the man from the Middle East has no thoughts of easing off and coasting home. Ian Donaldson's Metro has also been in the wars. A crash after the finish of stage 12 removed his front spoiler. He takes third place after Frank Maher sadly is forced out with a broken rear axle. And Austin McHale's unhappy rally is about to end after a puncture, a crash, and a breakdown. Some frontal damage is also evident on Hugh O'Brien's escort, but he finishes fourth. McDonald and McNamee are fifth in the Talbot Sunbeam. While Jody McGrath and Walter Cuddy twitch their way to sixth overall. David Wright and Leslie Fannin take Group N honours by finishing 10th in their standard cadet, surprisingly one place ahead of Frank Fennell in the more powerful Group A winning Opal.
Two tough days rallying are nearly over, and there's been a lot of attrition. And so it's back to Air Square for the finish of the Clarenbridge Crystal Galway International, where the crowds and Gary Gillespie await the first man ever to win this great rally three times. Right from the start, you looked like a man who was determined to win this event, Billy. Well, we were certainly um, under instructions to not to take it too easy, so uh, we, we deliberately, um, right from the word go, we, we put the pressure on and it um, seems to work very well. It really was a dream start for you, wasn't it? Yeah, we put a lot of effort into it and, you know, there were a few moments in the first couple of stages on ice when we went fairly near the edge of the road, but managed to stay there, so uh, I suppose that's what it's all about. Rolling on a good drive all the way around, no problems? Yeah, we didn't really have any problems, Gary. As Billy was saying, it was pretty uh, nerve-wracking yesterday morning on, uh, on the ice, but that's when we really got the initial lead and, and we held it down for the rest of the rally. The STP Tarmac Championship has got off to a resounding start for the Rothmans rally team with Coleman first and El Hajri second. Donaldson has given the Metro its first result in Ireland and De La Opel Team Ireland have won both Group A and Group N. Our next STP coverage will be the Rothman's Circuit of Ireland at Easter. Man.